is Tuesday, April 21st. This is the uh, House Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And we are uh, taking a um, testimony on uh, possible delays related to Act 173. Um, so Jim, you have been working with the Senate and ultimately this bill will start with the Senate. And can you give us an update as to where that bill is at this time? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, for the record, uh, Jim Demery, as consul, we wa walked through the draft Senate bill last week. Um, although there are two changes I wanted to highlight for you um, uh, since then. And, and the best way of highlighting the first change is to go to the um, sped uh, timing chart, the one that looks like this. So if, every, if, if you can pull that up for us, that would be helpful. <clears throat> okay. So the first change from last week is a very technical one. Um, let me just do this. Um, and the change involves the way in which the um, uniform base amount is computed. Um, so if you look at the boxes, um, the very last one uh, for fiscal year 27 um, talks about the uniform base amount. Uh, and that's where you get to the point where all school districts are using the same uh, amount per student um, uh, to determine the census grant. Um, uh, that uniform base amount, though it first applies in fiscal year 27, has to be known by fiscal year, year 24. And the reason for that is in fiscal year 24, you start moving, school districts start moving toward it. Um, so in the first year, in fiscal year 23, they're getting um, a, a grant that equals what they basically had gotten in previous years not on a per student basis, but just the amount of money that equates to what they got under the reimbursement system. And then in fiscal years 24, 25, and 26, they all start adjusting uh, the amount um, uh, expressed on a per student basis to the uniform base amount. So those are three transitional years. So you have to know in fiscal year 24, what the uniform base amount is uh, for, for fiscal year 27. So the way in which the, the uniform base amount is computed is it is um, the average of three years, it's the average of fiscal year 18, 19, and 20 funding for um, special education plus an inflator, okay? That's the key part of it. And the issue that I, I realized going through this was you won't know what the inflator is the fiscal year is 24, 25, and 26, because they haven't happened yet. So how can you inflate something that you don't know how to inflate? So uh, what the draft does is um, it inflates and takes the average of um, uh, funding for fiscal year 18, 19, and 20, plus an, infl an inflator um, for the years that are unknown. And then for the years that aren't known, fiscal year 24, 25, 26, we hit the average inflation rate from the previous years as a proxy, okay? I hope that's clear. We'll go through the draft now, but before I go to the draft, are there any questions with what I just uh, explained? It's definitely a little bit complicated uh, yeah. to follow. Um, does anybody have an intelligent question? <laughs> so, so, um, I just realized I don't have my, I don't have my list at the moment. There we go. Uh, Sarita. Yep. Austin. Can you, can he just, Jim, can you just say that one more time? If I am muted. Yeah, the, the, issue, the issue is, stepping back broadly, that you've got to, we've got to come up with a uniform base amount in fiscal 27. Yep. Which is an average of um, the amount um, spent on special education in fiscal years 18, 19, and 20, 
And that average is supposed to inflate uh, that, wh whether the inflation rate is from uh, those years all the way to, to fiscal year 27. But you have to know what the uniform base amount is in fiscal year 24. So you won't know what the inflation rate is for fiscal year 24, 25, or 26. So we have to come up with a proxy for that. And so all we're doing is we're taking the earlier inflation rate uh, and using that as a proxy for those years. Okay, great, so, thank so you. What, just to, to remind folks, who, who, folks that weren't here when this bill was developed, uh, this starts with um, everybody uses their, whatever their budget was, plus an inflator, um, averaged over three years um, based on a th uh, three year membership, correct? That's what the start is. Um, based on this year 23 you mean yes so that's the start now that means that some districts uh, are starting at a place and over time they're going to be getting more money as they're working toward a common plan yeah and so some are going to be getting less over yeah, time yeah, yeah. well so, they're, they're going to get the average of what they received before um, so the first year isn't a census grant because it's not based on a per student count. It's right. based on the amount that you received on average historically. Right. So you got a lump of money in fiscal year 23, and you take that lump of money and you divide it by your, your student count. So you come to a per student count amount or a per capita amount. Uh, and the issue in 23 is that that per capita amount is going to be all over the place because um, school districts would have received different amounts historically and reimbursement, and they'll have a different number of students. So, uh, therefore, in the intervening years 24, 25, 26, the, wherever you are, you're moving toward a uniform, a uniform amount. You're moving up or you're moving down to, to, toward that uniform amount in 27. Is that clear? As, does that make sense, folks, following that? So this particular section is just uh, fixing that point of confusion and, and identifying uh, identifying basically a, where you're going to be when you, when you move into the next inflator. Correct. And this is an issue with the original Bill 173. When I was going through all these state changes, I started to think more about this and realized actually it doesn't work the way it's drafted. So this is a fix for that. Yeah. And this is something you found from moving with it all these all this time it yeah. just sort of appeared as a, as a problem that we missed yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so if we could go then to the bill itself okay uh, and then Avery if we could scroll down to the first area where it's highlighted in yellow which is right here. Okay. So go up a little bit further, please. Right there, stop, thanks. Okay, so line four says, you for a base amount means an amount determined by, so we're dividing um, an amount equal to the average state appropriation for fiscal year, years 18, 19, and 20 um, for special education. Um, and then we're increasing that Let's go down a bit further, if you would. You're increasing that for, for inflation for the years that will be known. So uh, for fiscal years 21, 22, and 23, we were able to use the actual inflation rates for those years. Uh, and then by uh, 16, for the years where we won't know what the inflation rate is, because we have to know what this uniform base amount is by fiscal year 24. So for 24, 25, and 26, we're using the average inflation factor uh, for fiscal years 21, 22, and 23. Does that make sense? So that would be that would be your new start place then. That that's how, how this would be fixed. So the proxy for inflation yeah. on line 16 and 17 is the inflation rate, uh, the average inflation rate for year fiscal years 21, 22, and 23. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you for finding that. Um, and remember, too, that once the uniform base amount is set, 
it doesn't inflate after that. So after fiscal year 27, uh, it doesn't in, in, in increase. Uh, and that was where there could be potential cost savings over time. Just to, just to remind the committee. Okay, mm -hmm. Avery, if you could go down toward the end of the bill, where there's some and, more- and just, as a, just as a reminder, there could be cost savings as long as we end up putting in some of the practice changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So keep going, if you were Avery, to the yellow, right, right here. So now we have a new section four, which is um, amending Act 173, the section that, that um, creates consensus-based funding advisory group. And we're giving it a bit more life um, and a bit, a bit uh, more um, meaning. So on line 20, it says it will cease to exist uh, on June 30, 2023. So it's been extended by a year. That will bring you through the first year of grant funding. And then if you scroll down further, Avery. Um, so it's currently 2022. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was thinking it was uh, earlier than that, yeah. So uh, this is pretty standard language, but basically um, line five, we originally had eight meetings per year, but they need more meetings. Um, so we're moving it to 12 meetings per year in fiscal years 21, 22, and 23. Uh, and then the appropriation has to increase as well. So if you scroll down a bit further, um, on line 10, uh, the appropriation now per year is about $9,000. That would be appropriate for fiscal year 21. And then for the future years, the agency would include in its budget request uh, that amount of money for each of fiscal years 22 and 23. Okay. And, and that, those are the only changes to what we reviewed together last week. Has the Senate reviewed this language yet? Not at all. Uh, not at all. Okay. So we will need to address that. Um, so any questions for Jim before we go to Emily? Seeing none. Um, Emily, can we get a response from the agency? Yes, hello, for the record, Emily Simmons, General Counsel for the Agency of Education. I can respond to Jim's two changes in the bill, but perhaps I should first give the agency's position on the general topic. We haven't had that discussion in this committee together yet. So I submitted written testimony, which is identical to testimony that the Secretary of Education submitted to the Senate committee. Not trying to give you guys short shrift, just trying. I know you're working with the Senate committee very closely given all the procedural irregularities right now. So I'm trying to keep everyone on the same page, hearing the same rationale from the agency because it isn't different depending on who we're talking to. So the agency is recommending that the General Assembly pass another delay to the implementation of Act 173. That's primarily for three reasons. One being that the bill is a, primarily a fiscal bill. You know, it is driving hopefully some cost savings in the special education system. And as you have been talking about, this is a really uncertain economic time for the whole state, um, as well as supervisory unions and supervisory districts. So there's detail in my written testimony that I'm sure you'll go back and review, but the main idea is just that we're entering um, probably economically difficult times and it's not the wisest to push forward this change while there are so many unknowns in district budgets. Second is that staff resources, both at sort of the statewide stakeholder level, as well as district leadership and special education staff, teaching staff, support staff are really stressed in responding to COVID-19. And the agency doesn't see that stress being alleviated, certainly by the beginning of next school year. Next school year will be another dynamic, difficult time for all staff that uh, operate in the education field. And Act 173 requires a lot of professional development, change, planning that we don't think the field has bandwidth to do right now. The agency doesn't feel we have the bandwidth and we don't see it in the field. And then third is a um, reason related to the current rulemaking to implement the funding and special education programmatic rules. The state board is currently in public comment on those two rule series. 
And I think we all share the fear that engagement in that rulemaking process from important stakeholders really isn't going to be there because people are focused on the ongoing crisis. So those were our three rationale to push everything in Act 173 back one year. So the concept so far is in agreement. Now the detail. So um, the, the bill draft that Jim has been working on looks good to us. He's been consulting with me and with Brad James. Um, it was entertaining, maybe if I'm being flippant, to watch Brad James with his literal formulas and Jim with his narrative explanation go back and forth on that highly complex uh, language that Jim just presented to you. But we all landed in a place of agreement on the current draft. And I was no help at all. Those two handled it themselves. <laughs> Okay, so the agency currently supports the bill as drafted. Yes. Okay. Any questions for Avery? Okay. State Board of Education, John Carroll, I'd like to hear from you as you are intimately involved in this process. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm John Carroll, Chair of the State Board of Education. Uh, what I'm going to say is uh, uh, content that I've reviewed with the board by uh, email correspondence, but we have not had an opportunity to sit and, uh, as a group, uh, prepare a response uh, to your inquiry. Uh, but I have had uh, comments and helpful suggestions from a couple members. So I think what I'm saying is... Um, uh, pretty darn close to what the board as a, as a whole would say if they were being polled. Um, so I understand my charge here is to give you our responses to what we see in the content of the draft rec 20-954. I did uh, furnish to Avery this morning a copy of these comments um, and I'm sure she's made them available to you. Um, but let me just uh, summarize the, the, the way the board has uh, engaged with this. As you know, Act 173 stipulates that the board shall write rules that will govern the implementation of Act 173. And in our world of rules, there are sort of two bunches. One bunch pertains to the census-based funding and all of that kind of the core mechanism of the reform. And a second part that uh, people have kind of not paid a lot of attention to is um, the funding relationships with independent schools and how those must change. Not only the scope of what the independent schools must do, but the basis for uh, reimbursement for those services. That's in a separate uh, rule series and is very soon to be uh, taken up for revision. But let me go back to the census-based funding rules. The rules are already completely underway in the sense that they have to go through a very formal process of review under, that's dictated by um, 3 VSA uh, Chapter 25, the Administrative Rules Procedure. The State Board wor um, worked with the agency and with the advisory group over a period of about nine months they doing the vast amount of the work of drafting various and sometimes competing versions of the rules for census for implementing census-based funding. Um, and after nine, nearly 10 months, uh, the board felt that it had derived a consensus which reflected very much the views of both the agency and the advisory group, uh, as well as the board. And so we adopted um, what we what what's called the draft rule, and that's the beginning of the formal rulemaking process. So for ten months we did this kind of very informal back and forth, back and forth. The agency and the and the advisory group working very hard together, um, and then when the board adopts a proposed rule, which we did in its February meeting, then the formal rulemaking process begins. And that is a, a, those of you who have been around APA rulemaking know that it's a, it's a highly stylized dance. There's a, the, the, the law stipulates 
a whole sequence of events that must happen and the timing of those events. Uh, the, the day you file with the Secretary of State, the process begins. And by statute, the process can, must be completed in eight months or less. So the statute, we, we, the process began officially on the 12th of March when we filed with the Secretary of State. We met on the 9th with the Interagency Committee on Administrative Rules, which is a very um, important first step. Um, and so that means that the, the rulemaking process, if it were to go according to the normal process, would have to end in about mid-October, eight months. Um, it's underway already. In fact, now we're at the stage called um, public comment period. That began on the 17th of April and will conclude about the 27th of May. So immediately you can see there's a concern. Well, what about this public comment period? If it ends on the 27th of May, as you've heard from many people, folks just have not been able to be engaged with these rules. And the public comment period is the public's last chance to give input uh, on these rules. I, I might say parenthetically that the stakeholders who are interested in um, special education have definitely been at the table by way of the advisory group, which is an assemblage of many stakeholders from different perspectives. So it's not like this has all been happening in the dark behind closed doors. It's been a very, very public process that has given all of the stakeholders a, a voice, but certainly individual families and practitioners um, have not really been at the table. And that's the point of the public comment period. So we, the, we on the board feel that the public comment period should not come to an end on the 27th of May. We concur with those who say that it ought to be extended appreciably. However, it's against the law to do that uh, because the APA stipulates that the process must be completed in eight months. Um, and um, so one piece of what we advocate to you is that you incorporate in this, in your bill, explicit provision that says that the public comment period will be extended until the 31st of December of this year, adding seven months to a, uh, an already six week period. Um, and that would, we, we are under the impression that would give practitioners and parents of special needs children and others who are interested lots of additional time in what hope we all hope will be a more normal time. This is sort of operating on the, on the faithful hope that school will resume in the autumn. And we certainly know that, for example, parents of special needs children with school closed have their hands absolutely full, taking good care of their, their kids with special needs. Um, and their bandwidth is pretty well absorbed in that. And until school resumes and those children are back in school, those parents won't, will, they're underwater in just dealing with, with their children's needs. So it's our hope that when school resumes, then there'll be time and bandwidth for parents to come and tell us what they think about these proposed rules. So the, the first proposal we make is that we advocate that you put language in the bill that addresses the um, termination of rulemaking and the, and the way you have it now does not do the job because um, uh, three VSA, um, I think it's uh, four, um, eight, 843C stipulates that we have to be done by October. What we're saying is no, we don't wanna be done by October. We want the public comment period to go on until the end of December and then after that, there's another two months of processing that has to happen. So um, I can work with Jim if you like to uh, compose some language about that. But that's the first of our of our um, advocacies to you. Is so that just we hold, hold one second second for that? Um, are there any questions on that portion of, of his request? Emily, do you have a feedback on that yet? 
Sure, that sounds reasonable to me as well. That I think that it's a fair option. Without adding anything into the bill, um, we would assist the state board in receiving dispensation from LCAR to exceed the normal eight month limit. I, I think we could all be pretty confident if you passed legislation extending the deadline, then LCAR would feel comfortable granting an extension. But if you're more comfortable and the board is more comfortable putting it right in the bill, that's fine too. And Jim, you see a problem with that? Sorry, uh, no problem. No. Okay. Yeah, the, th thank you. The, as to Emily's comment, uh, the reason we would like to see it in the legislation is that the process works in such a way that when you go to LCAR, that is at the end of your public comment period, you can ask for permission to extend the eight months. Well, we won't see Elcar. We, we don't want to see Elcar. We don't want to be at the end of the public comment period until we've already exceeded the eight months. So that's why having you folks address it in statute would totally eliminate any uh, confusion about why did you come to us so late about this. Uh, if I may, I'll go on to the second um, uh, observation we have, and this is uh, simply to concur with uh, the draft and the agency uh, in the proposal that the census-based funding elements of the bill and the rules not go into effect until a year later, i.e. on July 2022. Uh, the board is completely um, sympathetic with the advocacy for that. We can see all the reasons you've heard and then some as to why implementation um, before that time is just placing an inordinate and unacceptable burden on practitioners especially in the field, but also at the agency and elsewhere. And just to clarify in the details, that's in the current draft. Correct, and, and we concur with that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, this, the, I mentioned at the beginning that there's two totally separate sets of rules here because there's the statute really takes two very significant initiatives. Well, more than two. Now, I'm gonna stop you one, one just one quick second. Um, committee, are you you comfortable with, with uh, moving in that direction? Anybody have a problem with that? Seeing none and no hands raised, uh, let's go ahead and address that in the bill then. Go ahead then, John, thank you. So the second part of my comments relates to this, the other key initiative of Act 173 as it relates to special ed directly, and that is the independent schools, the role of the approved independent schools in special education and how they're to be compensated for their, what they do. <clears throat> and as you know, that's been a source of some controversy um, <clears throat> among stakeholders for some time. Um, and so Act 173 dictates that on a separate schedule, well, the, the law doesn't, but the agency determined that on a separate schedule, the um, new rules for how approved independent schools shall participate in special education would be developed by the state board. Um, and that's stipulated by the act. It's on a separate schedule. And the work on those new rules has not yet begun. In fact, at the board's February meeting, when we kind of finished up with the census-based funding rules, we turned to the stakeholders and said, okay, let's get going on the rules for independent schools. It was a long conversation. And out of that conversation emerged a couple of things. Current statute, Act 173, stipulates that the formal rulemaking process, i.e. the APA process, will start on the 1st of November of this year. Our experience with the census day funding was that that was a 10 month process, maybe longer. And we're concerned that if the independent school uh, rulemaking process is a 10 month process, we're already too late to meet a November one deadline. So our first uh, proposal in this connection with regard to what's called the 2200 rules, which is the independent school rules, our first request of you is to um, include in the stat in in the bill before you language that that revises the startup date from one November to one March of 2020. 
That's the, the that's the date the date that uh, 21 you're saying. Yeah, pardon me, 2021. Thank you. Yeah. So moving that back um, five months, we are hopeful we'll give the stakeholders and the agency time to uh, do all this uh, very serious and important preparatory work of getting the first draft pulled together. Uh, these first drafts are vitally important um, and getting them right beforehand saves everybody a whole lot of time later on. So, um, so then we're advocating that in section four that be modified to address specifically the rule 2200 rules. And again, I'm happy to work with Jim to, um, uh, to adjust that language. The second part about the independent school rules is that it had always been expected that those rules would go into effect on 1 July, 2022. Not always, but it, for the last couple of years, that's been the understanding. And as you know, the census-based funding was to go into effect a year earlier. And at our February meeting, we had a discussion about this, and it was agreed that it's really kind of undesirable to have the census-based funding go into effect in 2021 and to have the independent school rules go into effect in 2022. At that time in February, before all of this happened, um, the conclusion was on balance, it's best to move forward with the census based funding 2021 and leave and, and leave the independent school implementation a year later. Even though it would be nice to have them all together, there were other reasons not to do that. Now, of course, what you've done is for good reason, you've moved implementation of census based funding back by a whole year to 2022. That strikes us as a terrific opportunity now if we could keep the independent school rules implementing at the time they always have been, i.e. 2022. Then you're bringing both the census-based funding and the independent school funding together on, online all at the same time, rather than having the LEAs having to deal with two totally different ways of doing things for a year. I did speak uh, informally with uh, Megan Roy about this and um, she concurs that there's a lot of advantage to implementing both at the same time, i.e. now that you've moved back the census based funding in 2022. However, in your bill, and I presume as a result of advocacy by the independent school stakeholders, in your bill, you've moved the independent schools back a year also. So that uh, once again now, they're out of sync. And to us, that seems to be um, at the very least unfortunate. Um, so our, our, um, our comment about, about your language in section seven, in the piece that uh, refers to sections 20A and 21 of Act uh, 173, where you, put in a new date of 2023, our comment is that we question that. I don't think we're quite prepared to say we oppose it because we frankly haven't received testimony from the independent schools in any significant degree that would explain why they would advocate for this. So um, could I just clarify, that was just a little bit confusing. So basically the way it was originally structured, they were gonna be in a year later. Yep. Um, the way the current bill is with more time that puts them together. No, which, it, it moves them both back a year. But, but so that they'll be happening together or separately? Separately. You, I, I thought I heard you say you wanted them to be happening at the same time. We do. So, you want the, yeah. So you we want would like to have you not move the school, independent schools back by a year with the result that they would both be happening at the same time. Because um, you're moving census-based funding back to where independent schools funding was gonna be. And, um, but apparently you've heard from, or somebody has heard from interest groups that advocate 
delaying the independent school implementation by a year. Um, I'm sure there are, there are good reasons for doing so, but we would say there are also very good reasons for making that happen as quickly as possible and keep having them both go online in 2022 at the same time. Let me just check with Jim. Do you remember what our uh, reasoning was for having them at a different time? Um, originally, I think just the complexity of how this will all work for independent mm -hmm. schools. I think people that may be needing more, more time to work all that out. Mm -hmm. um, the reason it got moved out now, though, by a year is um, advocacy by uh, Patty Comline to Center Education. Okay. So, okay. And do you remember what their reasoning was for wanting to not be happening at the same time? I don't know, no. Okay. Yeah, um, I think- my, Catherine my, James, my, oh, go ahead. My, my impression is that they're not opposed to it happening at the same time. My impression is that in, in, they're rather simply saying that they too will find it difficult to get everything organized because of this uh, period of dysfunction that we're enduring right now. Um, but I think it's fair to say that implementing and, and getting, getting everybody on board with the independent school rules is not as complicated an undertaking as is the census-based funding, which changes the universe for all Vermont educators, um, the, the independent school rules, first of all, there are far fewer of them who are involved in, in this work. Um, uh, and, and it's mainly the LEAs that would be influenced in the public side. So I- Kathleen James had a question. Um, I did, thanks. And I, I meant to ask this about this when we were talking about this last week. So are we talking about independent schools like BBA and St. J, or are we talking here about um, independent schools that deliver only special ed? Good clarification. <laughs> or all of the Emily, above. Is that correct, or is it, Emily has a comment? It's only the general purpose independent schools. The funding mechanisms for the special purpose independent schools are largely addressed in the current rulemaking, but in some ways, Act 173 carved those special purpose independent schools out. So it's hard to give you a clear cut answer, but I can say pretty confidently that Rule Series 2200 is for um, general purpose independent schools primarily. And that's the, the so, big four in particular. My mind okay. with me as to how that works. So the um, Act 173 requires certain approved independent schools to accept a student on an LEA, uh, I, sorry, IEP, um, if recommended by the LEA. So if the LEA says that this is the right school for that child, then the approved independent school has to accept that child. Um, basically, that's what it does. It carves out, though, uh, schools that specialize in special education. Um, so it's for the job purpose schools, not for the specialty schools. <clears throat> so, so the history of this is that the, the big four had originally been given an extra year to make this transition. We were going to retain that extra year. Mr. Carroll is recommending that everybody be on the same schedule and that the big four not be given an extra year. Yeah, so originally it was staggered by a year. Originally, the right. funding went in year one, let's say, year two, the approved independent school uh, changes would apply. And that's what's happening now in your current bill. Which is right, right. That year. Yeah. But, and Mr. Carroll is saying, let's just have it all, let's have the independent schools go at the same time. That's right. Okay. Right. So I guess I would just say, Personally, um, I just need a sec to check that out with BBA. <laughs> so. um, Emily, did you have a thought? So um, one thing in direct response to Representative James, it's not the big four, it's about, I would say a hundred in approved independent schools um, that are in the same exact category as the big four. They're all equally impacted, although they have st smaller student populations, certainly. And then- okay. 
I'm just having a very parochial moment right now. Please, please forgive me. <laughs> well, and, and one of the big four is right in your backyard. So that's where your brain is, of course. Um, and then second, the agency's written testimony requests that all deadlines on Act 173 be pushed back a year, which would not be in line with what the state board is asking. The consideration about capacity of the field was our main reason for making the really hard call it was really difficult that the, the agency thinks that the independent schools provisions should also be pushed back one year. Those are incredibly complex for the SUs that have tuitioning districts within them, which is a majority of our SUs still, even though we have some that don't tuition at all. And um, our concerns about capacity are even more serious there. Our um, say our highest functioning supervisory unions and supervisory districts also tend to be those that would not be, that would sort of be out of this second phase. Um, think of your Chittenden County districts that are all a single unified district. They are the only ones that won't be impacted by these independent rules changes. And we're generally not worried about their capacity compared to some of our other areas of the state on any issue. So, um, so the agency thinks that everything should be pushed back a year. Okay, thanks. Kathleen, these are, this, this is critical questions that you're asking, so don't, don't, don't be hard on yourself. Um, Sarita and then Peter. Um, yeah, so I just wanna clarify, uh, what year would independent schools be required to accept students uh, on IEPs? if they were sent by the LEA? Uh, so the first year in, in the bill you have before you now, they would have to start accepting the students in fiscal year 24. So for the 23-24 school year. And does that align with this change? Is, this, is that with the proposed change that we're talking about? Yes, yeah, so that pushes it out by a year. That is, I believe, what the agency supports. And the board is raising questions about the need and merits of that. Um, we've heard from a, a lot of, uh, informally from LEAs, um, uh, that they feel that uh, keeping the independent schools, uh, deploying the independent school rules at the same time as the census-based funding is well advised. And that would be 23-24? Uh, it would be 22. Your bill says 23-24, the, yeah. the but the current law says 22. And the board is advocating that we stay with current law and not okay. postpone the independent schools. Okay, great, thank you. Peter I, I think that that um, addressed some of my questions. And what we're really talking about here is any approved independent school that can receive state tuition dollars. So when you, so when Emily was talking about there being more than just the, the, the historic four, um, it's any private school that's taking state dollars. This includes a requirement that if they're taking state dollars, that therefore they also have to accept special education or students on IEPs? No, it's right. it's a really big step forward for the independent school community. Right, uh, and, some of them and, have been, some of them are built around that. But the, the general purpose independent schools, um, many of them have played only a, a modified and moderate engagement with independent school with special ed needs children. And this change, this is a game changer for them. It's a very big step forward for them. I can understand why the independent schools are uneasy about all of this, uh, but it's uh, it's gonna happen and it's just a question of how soon. Right, and, and our historic academies have, have been accepting students on IEPs all along because they act as, as our public high schools basically. Right, yep. um, But this would, it, this would also mean that um, tuition dollars going to Deerfield, for example, if they don't want to comply with our rules about accepting students on IEP, then um, they would lose their approved independent school status. 
Um, I, I think not. I see Emily shaking her head and I defer to her knowledge on this. Emily? The State Board only has authority to approve independent schools in Vermont. It may also recognize the approval status of other states. And so when we have questions about private schools out of state, they're not approved independent schools, they're just private schools that Vermont students would like to attend with public dollars. We look to the status of that school, either under the regulations of its home state or its NEASC approval and the state board and its rules has recognized that, I guess it's NECHI now, not NEASC, the accreditation agency for secondary schools as equivalent to our Vermont standards. So any school that has that NECHI accreditation, we treat as approved to allow tuition to go to that school. And so they really would be unaffected by, I believe by so. any of this. To clarify, so, so. to clarify, though, um, I believe that the independent schools can agree to accept, currently accept certain categories of uh, special education. It's not every single category, if I understand it correctly. You are correct, Madam Chair. There are 12 categories under their current rules of, for special education services. The majority of our larger approved independent schools serve nine or 10, maybe even all 12 of those categories. So they're able to provide services to the vast majority of publicly funded students. But we can't say as a blanket statement that our academies enroll every student regardless of need who wishes to attend with public dollars because that's just not always able to happen. So it still would it still would identify defined categories. The changes in Act 173 explicitly call for getting rid of categories, and um, it sets up a system that is really case by case, student by student. The decision of a student's IEP team in consultation with the approved independent school to en to enroll each student. So the LEA determines best placement yes they first to, comes they, student choice and then the iep team evaluates the practicality of honoring that student choice um, that might even include pushing in services from the su's staff to that independent school in the most extreme case and it, act 173 does allow for the lea to say no there are no strategies that we can use to enroll that student in that school, but it's supposed to be a very rare case. Other questions? So Madam Chair, if I may just summarize. Yes. Uh, so um, we have, of the, of the four points we're making, uh, one of them is um, uncompromised support for extending uh, the rollout of census-based funding as you have proposed it to 2023. Uh, the second is uh, serious questions about postponing, uh, I'm sorry, to 2022, serious questions about uh, postponing independent school rollout to 2023 a year later and advocating that serious thought be given to holding independent school implementation to the same date as census-based funding, i.e. 2022. And then two um, requests that be addressed uh, in, in, the, in the bill with regard to rulemaking. With regard to the rulemaking that's already underway, the census-based funding uh, rulemaking, we're asking that um, you stipulate that the public comment period end in December as opposed to May of this year. Uh, and that that would also include a language that uh, allows the board to therefore exceed the eight month um, limitation of the APA rules. And then the second uh, is to ask that for the rule 2200 series, the independent school rulemaking, that you uh, change the must initiate date from one November to one March.
And you have representation on the board from the independent schools, correct? Um, the, the board has no designated representatives. We are all at large independent appointees. With people that have background. With, I think at least one person who has some connection to an independent school. But we, we, don't, we don't wear stakeholder hats on the board. We invite stakeholders to come speak to us and we certainly will expect to hear from the independent schools about all this. Okay. And have you reviewed this, these concerns with the Senate yet? No, ma'am. Okay. Because they're, they're, they're beginning this. We're, we're just sort of working concomitantly because of the challenges we have in, in uh, moving things forward with remote voting. So it's a little bit of a head spinner for our poor ledge council, but um, <laughs> we're trying to figure it out. So thank you. Um, we will take this under advisement. Um, and appreciate your being here. And if you can hang out, that would be great. We may oh, well. have another question for you um, as we move forward. So next on the list um, is Kristen Murphy from Developmental Disabilities Council. So Kristen. Yes, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. All right, so for the record, um, I'm Kirsten Murphy and I'm the Executive Director of your state's Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, councils exist in every state and territory and by federal statute, our job is to ensure that family caregivers and self-advocates are part of policy making when that policy is going to impact their lives. Um, so as such, we, we spend a lot of time polling our members and other families um, to make sure that we are informed by a broader voice. Um, so it's not my opinion, it's, it's more reflective of the people that we, that we talk with. Um, we have um, monitored the Act 173 um, advisory board very carefully. I send our policy analyst, Susan Aronoff, who's an attorney, to watch that process carefully. Um, it is a very comp it has been a very complicated process that this I think the the state has gotten a lot of really wonderful expertise, especially from the legal aid attorney that uh, chairs that group and um, it's hopefully been very ha helpful to the state. Um, it's also just a very complicated process that the average family would not um, easily access, I have to say. Um, so I can be very brief. Um, the Developmental Disabilities Council has been an enthusiastic supporter of Act 173 because of the practice changes that it is predicated on, multi-tiered systems of support and positive behavioral interventions and supports. Um, we um, agree that the, the, the process should be delayed a year, um, certainly because of the current crisis, because there hasn't been enough professional development to ensure that schools across the board are really taking up these important practices that will allow the new funding formula to be the most successful that it can be. Um, and then we're also aware that um, the agency is already um, additionally burdened by needing to figure out things like distance learning, how to deploy funding that's coming from the federal government through the CARES Act, and the people waiting study is, is also out there and needs to be addressed. So that's, that's a pretty heavy lift for, for the agency and its community partners. Um, I, I came prepared to, to um, with the thought that perhaps the board was, was not gonna be as supportive as they are of delaying the public comment period. That is, that is our, our main desire is that we give families an opportunity to fairly use the public comment period. And it, it sounds um, from Mr. Carroll's testimony that, that they are also supportive. Families um, and advocates have waited a long time to have an opportunity to um, address the special education rules. And I, I think that delaying the public comment period to the end of December is, is more than generous. And that would work very well for, for, for families who are just completely overburdened right now. And um, that is all I came prepared to say today. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? You have an important voice in the, in the process. Um, 
So the current bill as drafted and the direction we're going in seems to be enough to provide room for the people that you represent to be part I, of I the believe process. it does, yes. Okay, great. That's with the recommendations from the chair of the state board. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Sarita, did I miss you on a question a little while ago? I just I just remembered that was it, there. It just it was answered. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Thank, you. Um, Thank you. And I will need to, to leave now because I have a, a Zoom meeting with 200 parents <laughs> this afternoon. So thank oh, you very much. <laughs> we wish you well. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Tracy Sawyers, you've been involved in this process for a little while here. Yes. <laughs> I'm right. interested um, in your feedback on the current draft. Yes. So um, again, Tracy Sawyer is executive director of the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators. And thank you as always for having me. Um, while VCSEA has always supported Act 173, we also do support the delay as outlined in the draft bill. Um, the bill's straightforward and the delays, it delays all of the relevant timelines. Um, MTSS is a critical component of this. And we already had concerns about the progress of the rollout of statewide um, and districts will now definitely need additional time around um, this component. And more fundamentally, as you're aware, districts have undergone a complete redesign of the delivery of education, including special education services. And we're going to need time to understand what this means for the future. In addition, with the financials, um, finances so uncertain, we should not be changing our funding structure when we're also facing enormous financial implications of the crisis. It's the enormity of the COVID-19 um, impact on schools both programmatically and uh, financially makes Act 173 implementation nearly impossible and certainly not advisable if we want it to be implemented as envisioned and in fact not do harm. Um, as you've heard, the 1300 series and 2360 rules are currently open um, for public comment and VCSEA has been following these closely. A delay in the effective date of the rules will allow the state board to extend the public comment period as you've heard about. Um, and this is very important as well. We also think the independent school rules, the 2200 series as Chair Carroll discussed, will also be a lot of work related to how independent schools are to be reimbursed and how they will generally participate. So that's gonna be a big area. Um, I do agree um, with Chair Carroll that there has been a challenge with the block grant starting first for public schools and then independent school portion starting one year later. Um, and this does continue it in this draft. For us, it never made sense that we would change the fun funding and then not resolve the independent school issue caused by that staggered implementation. But I will say in these, um, Unprecedented times, Jeff Francis and Sue and Jay and I have met with Patty Comlin and um, in our conversations has agreed to the delay for them as well um, as it would be. Um, they're also overwhelmed and, you know, as this is a period of dysfunction and things are very uncertain right now. But it's interesting, you know, to, to think about for those of us who were around when this bill was passed, the final Act 173 bill ended up being two bills put together. So it was the census-based funding component that particularly House Education was working on and then Senate Education was working on an independent school bill. Um, and so they were put together right at the end. Um, and so some of the timelines, I think that's part of the reason that there was a staggered timeline. It certainly felt like, um, you know, for independent schools, the requirement to take all special education children, if the IEP calls for it, felt like a heavy lift for independent schools. And, and it is. Um, it was pushed out further than BCSEA had originally wanted the year that this passed, um, because it really is an equity issue about getting kids um, the services they need. But we, and it's getting pushed out again. I think we're just in such uncertain um, times that we feel like that's, you know, I guess, reasonable at this point if everything else is being pushed out. Um, we certainly support the continuation of the Census-Based Funding Advisory Group. It's been a key part of Act 173 planning and implementation and was critical in getting the rules in a place that really reflected legislative intent. And there's been some really good collaboration 
from schools and advocates and independent schools. Independent schools have two seats on that census-based advisory uh, group. So they've been, um, there's been a lot of, of good collaboration and Megan Roy is our member rep and I attend all those meetings. Um, and I think that they've just been, that's also been just a critical part of getting us to where we are um, at this point. So I'm glad to see that included. And I think that's really all I have to, to say um, the SCA supports the draft delay bill. And the uh -oh. you froze up, Kate. Oh, I did, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and th as well as the changes in the, um, the, the rulemaking as recommended by the State Board of Ed, other yes. than the independent school change. Yes. Other questions, Peter Conlon. Uh, just curious, Tracy, if your group or if you know if the advisory committee has a position on um, syncing the independent school rules with the um, public school rules as the state board is recommending. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we would support that. We support the, what the state board recommends. Um, the rules have just really been, you know, we pay extra attention, my members, um, to the rules. And so there was so much work with the the rules that are open now. Um, and again, we do believe that the independent school rules will also be a challenge to really figure out how they, they fit in the construct. Um, but I think the importance of public comment, the importance of people not having bandwidth, I think there needs to be, those rules are critical to get right. Um, and so I think we need to be realistic about the time we need to to get them. I, I was asking more specifically about uh, the board's recommendation that the independent rules actually don't be delayed a year so that they're um, happening simultaneously with the public school rules. Yeah, I think um, we, at this point, we support an overall um, rollout, you know, delay in the specific timelines. Um, as in this bill, and I do agree with, we would support um, what Chair Carroll talked about related to the rules. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? I don't think I see anything. Um, thank you, thank you, Chair. Oh, um, Representative James, did you have something? I did, sorry, I couldn't find my little hand. <laughs> <laughs> I was panicking, trying to find my hand. You know. <laughs> so, uh, um, Tracy, I, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't sure. I, I thought I heard you say um, two different things. I, I thought I heard you say that you understood the complexity of the rules um, around independent schools and that they might need the extra year. And then I thought I heard you say that you would support um, Mr. Carroll's recommendation that independent schools didn't need the extra year and that everything should be synced up to the same timeline. So I, I wasn't sure which way you were going. Right, I think what I was saying was that um, we do agree that um, the whole issue about um, the staggered implementation was problematic. And so that was something that we um, have been talking about um, so I agree with what Chair Carroll says. It has been potentially problematic to have the schools move forward into the block grant um, and then having figuring it out for independent schools um, the next year. So that, that makes challenges with reimbursement and all those other things. I think what I said was that in this unusual situation and when we met the other association EDs with Patty Comlin, I think we understand that they feel overwhelmed. It's a period of dysfunction and things are really uncertain. So it seems to make sense to go ahead and give them the extra ideal, year. move everybody. I mean, I think everybody's it's very uncertain for everybody, as you well know. I think I'm still hearing kind of two things. I, I'm still yeah. not, not, not <laughs> clear. I, I can't tell if you're saying that we should do it the way our bill says, which is they have an extra year. I think you should do it the way your bill says. Okay. 
I'm just so like not bringing up that what Chair Carroll talked about is an issue and something that we've talked about, but we support what's in the bill okay. around that delay. Thank and, you. And that's, the, the, and that's what the AOE supports as well. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, we'll move on to the principals, Jay Nichols. Good afternoon, everybody. Maybe I can make this even more complicated. Okay. I'll, I'll try not to. Uh, <laughs> Jay Nichols, for the record, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding uh, consideration of delaying all aspects of 173 for an additional year. Um, I want to make clear, I think I'm the only one testifying today that's a member of the Census-Based Advisory Group. And I want to make clear that my brief testimony today does not represent the advisory group as we have not been able to meet officially to discuss this issue. Although I suspect we will all support the delay and I think Megan has talked about how she's talked with each of us online or offline, excuse me. Actually, we, do have online, some, uh, we do have some testimony from her online. Uh, so first of all, not part of my written testimony, but I want to add in here, uh, John's request for language uh, in the bill, um, if Jim and Emily think this is the way to go, notwithstanding the eight month limit of the rulemaking process for this bill to allow for appropriate opportunity for families and individuals to weigh in on 173 implementation rules. I think that's a fantastic idea given these times. I think we should, and I think personally, I think it'd be better if it was actually in this bill, something that said notwithstanding BSA, you know, whatever that law is, we're gonna extend this for eight months. So I, I like that idea a lot. I think it'd be good for uh, people to have an opportunity. We wanna make sure, Special Ed's very near and dear to, to our families, and we want to make sure they have plenty of opportunity to, to comment on any, any rule changes. Um, I've advocated for 173, as you know. I believe with proper implementation, uh, especially in terms of changing instructional practices, this can be a game changer that will make a huge difference in the learning of our most vulnerable children. Not only those receiving special education services, but any students who struggle academically. If we can make sure to implement the law with the flexibility school leaders and teachers need, and the opportunities will be there to really make a positive difference for these students. <clears throat> I also believe um, there's two parts of this law in my mind. One is the instructional changes. The other one is bending the financial um, increases of special ed. And I think that this law has the potential to bend the curve on special education spending over time. It won't lower spending over time, but I do believe it may work to lower the increases of special education costs by allowing districts more options to effectively meet the needs of all students. But unless instructional prices change, the goals of the law are not gonna be realized. And for instructional prices to improve, professional learning and training, as other people have spoke to, is required. I do not think at this time that districts are ready to effectively implement these changes in practice at this time. Uh, right now, the COVID-19 crisis is front and center in everything everyone is doing. Uh, at the very least, the last part of the school year has really very little, if any, opportunity for best practices related to the implementation of 173. I think the AOE is 100% correct in advocating uh, for an additional year before implementation. And quite frankly, we, we may even have to delay even further down the road if we don't have um, the thorough training provided to every school district in the state as necessary. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know if we're gonna be opening schools in the fall right now. I mean, hopefully we will, but again, we have to be thoughtful about that. So I think this has, a, has to be a priority and right now, it can't be a priority. So for those reasons, I fully support a one-year delay of all aspects of 173, the census-based funding special education law. Quick testimony. Any questions? You don't have an opinion that you don't have an opinion on the independent school. So I do. My original opinion, I testified to this three or four years ago, was I thought everything should start at the same time, uh, and I was outgunned on that, obviously. I do now, I actually would disagree with John's assessment. And the reason I would is, I think that the public schools that are gonna, gonna work with the independent schools, they need more time and because of that, giving them all the time to get to where they need to be and then having the independent schools implement the year after, I think that's a strategy now that I would actually support. So I've kind of changed a little bit on that just because I think there's gonna be enough on the plates of the publics that there's no reason to rush to add the independence a year earlier. And you're also a fan of continuing the advisory group. Yeah, I just, I'd like to be able to get off it before I retire, but you know. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, any other questions? And we'll move on to Jeff Bannon for the teachers, MEA. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and for the record, Jeff Bannon from Vermont and EA. Uh, and like Jay, I too serve on the, uh, uh, the Act 173 advisory uh, group. Uh, and it's been a good group. Uh, and we do a lot of good work and there's a lot of work to be done. I, I, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to perhaps be the, uh, the person who drops the skunk in the middle of the table here when it comes to Act 173. Um, Why didn't I put you last? <laughs> <laughs> this timing is everything. Uh, so we, we, we um, uh, when Act 173 was passed in 2018, it was passed with a lot of fanfare, uh, a lot of hope, and a lot of questions. And those questions were to be answered by the, by the advisor group. Uh, and, the, and that group is working through those questions. Um, and I, I, this should be not a surprise to Emily uh, I, I testified in Senate education a while ago about this. Um, I, I, we are very concerned about the rollout of, of Act 173. Uh, and, and, and I disagree with the Secretary of Education in this regard uh, in that the overarching impetus behind 173 was not about finance. It was about practice, as Jay just alluded to. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the DMG report upon which Act 173 was, the, that was the foundation of 173, not the UVM money report, uh, if you will, but it was, the, it was the DMG report that they worked with 10 or so schools. Uh, they did some incredibly high quality work, intensive professional development with staff uh, in those 10, 10 or so schools. And that was the impetus behind 173. In other words, we understood that if you had to change the system, you had to change the culture. And the culture was how we delivered services. And if we're gonna change those services and the, the, the delivery of those services, uh, we need to actually do train people. And it's not just a one or two hour training session or one or two times, one or two day sessions. Uh, I believe that DMG has testified before your committee a month or so ago um, that it was on, it's, it's several years of intensive ongoing training, followed up by more training thereafter in order to change the culture and the practice. So we've not done that, just to be very blunt. Uh, a lot of reasons why we haven't, and certainly now during the COVID crisis, we're not doing it at all, and, and for good and valid reasons now. Um, but certainly we think that a one-year delay is insufficient and here's the skunk in the room, we're pushing, we're belie we believe that there should be an indefinite delay in the implementation of 173, pending uh, complete and full uh, rollout of professional development for staff across the state so that they can actually change their practice and change the culture. And then you back into the, the finances and how you change the payment schemes. Um, so that's, that is the, the skunk in the room that I'm dropping here we think indefinite delay is the right approach, uh, given all that's going on now, given what needs to be done in order to implement fully 173. And it's going to take several years to do that, you know, given DMG's testimony to this to your committee uh, a month or so ago. So that's that's the uh, the sum of our, our of my testimony. I'm happy to answer questions. There may be a lot of questions uh, that, that I, I raised for you. It's no secret we've not been uh, thoroughly pleased with the rollout of 173, um, and we're trying to make sure that the 173 advisory group continues, number one, I think it should continue, to make sure that PD, the professional development, is delivered in an effective, concrete manner uh, in the, around the state so that everybody can change their practice and then we can change the finances. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, and go from there. So, so I guess my question is, if an, an indefinite delay puts no pressure on anything, it just sits there. A delay keeps the conversation going. So I'm, I'm unclear why you would, you would not want to keep the pressure on. Well, I would, <clears throat> fair enough. That's a fair um, criticism of an indefinite delay. The indefinite delay would be uh, timed and pressured with you. In other words, it's effectively saying to, 
you know, we're going to stop 173. You need to pass a law to say that. But in, in place of it, we're going to require schools to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and those targets would have to be met uh, on, a, on a regular ongoing basis to, to professionally develop educators so they can deliver the services in a different manner. So there would be, I guess, announced targets in an indefinite delay bill of 173 thereby keeping the pressure on to change the culture. We actually think there is some good out of 173. We supported it. Uh, we had a lot of questions. A lot of people had a lot of questions, but we supported it because we thought it was in the best interest of kids to change how they pra how the services were delivered for kids on special, uh, on IEPs and kids who were not yet and hopefully never on an IEP. That was the goal, right? To get uh, us to change practice, deliver services in a different way for all kids across the board so that we could reduce the number of kids on IEPs or certainly reduce uh, their, their needs. <clears throat> and I think that's, that's still a laudable goal. We support the goal, but we think indefinite delay in implementing that with targets to achieve the goals of Act 173 are necessary and thereby keeping the pressure on. So I guess another question would be, you know, when I look back to the development of that bill, one of the people that was really um, sort of moving forward with it was the former deputy secretary. When that position was eliminated, um, there, was, so there was a sort of loss of that direction or loss of that power. Would you think that what we need is, you know, another position of the agency? Uh, to address this. Yeah, I haven't, haven't thought of that. I, I think of my neighbor, Karen Edwards, who retired a couple of years ago. So she was doing that kind of work. Too. I chatted with her, with her uh, just before all of this happened. We were able to speak in person. I bumped into her. And so I think that the there's been a loss at the, the agency, and that's understandable. And I think they're trying to and they have filled those gaps. And I think they're working in that direction. But uh, there were certainly a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I'll just speak to, to Karen I and mean, a lot of history, a lot of knowledge dating back years. Um, and, and I think that's not easy to replace. And I think people are coming on board. There's a lot of challenges right now with special ed in the remote learning environment and people are getting up to speed quickly in that world. Uh, but as to this, I think, you know, I think everybody needs a little bit more time to get up to speed. And that's why I think certainly a delay is, is um, what's necessary at a minimum. Any questions? Um, Kayla Bell? Uh, I, I did not have my hand up. Did you um, yet, Kayla? No, you didn't? Well, your little blue hand was right up. <laughs> uh, no, not, um, not on my end, yeah. I don't know. It's not. I'm looking at my thing. It's not up. Well, maybe maybe it's me. <laughs> um, it's been me before. <laughs> okay. So so committee. There have been some things brought. Oh, um, yes, Kathleen Chase. Yeah, um, Jeff. I'll I'll try to see if I can word this succinctly. But so if you think about um, if you think about the professional development that's required, and then the funding switch. And then if you think about um, the things that we're asking schools to do in terms of time and, and, and resources and energy, basically, um, if, we, if we took you up on your suggestion and did an indefinite delay, and then ask districts to get really serious about the professional development and getting teachers ready for this massive practice switch. How do you think the burden on them would change? Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is how um, would it just put things off? I guess I, I'm just trying to dig a little bit deeper into Kate's question. Like, right. Would they still be looking at a lot of work that they'd have to be do that we would expect them to do this coming year, or um, would it be like we're going to give you a break this year? But like, how do you see that? I guess in practice, really rolling out. So a couple things, um, and I'll try to address it. And if I miss it, let me know. Um, I, I I tend to agree with Jay. I think a one-year delay is good. It's better than than not. 
but I think in the practical realities are in this Corona COVID environment, I think we may be looking at a two year delay at a minimum. Uh, I'm, I'm suggesting a longer delay to give schools and educators time to actually get trained and ready to, to change their practice. Um, teachers are necessary, are for the large part compliant <clears throat> and they try to be compliant and they work with kids and, 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 and their administrators to do uh, what I think essentially is the right thing to, to change how they're, they're going to deliver their, serve, their practice. Um, and I think in that regard, they will uh, change, they'll, they'll do the PD necessary. It may take some time. And as DMG said, it may take two, three years of, of fairly intensive training to change how they think and, and deliver services. But that's okay. I think they will do it. Um, but given that when we do go back to school, and I, again, I'm with Jay on this, I hope it's in August, September of this year, uh, but I'm not so certain now, um, or if it is, it's going to be some, look uh, very different, perhaps. Um, I think there is a lot of um, work that teachers need to do immediately now in, in May to get ready to bring kids back. Because we, as I, I think I've testified to this committee before about this more recently, uh, the kids are coming back. Uh, they will have more challenges and educators and schools will have more challenges than ever before. Uh, we, we, the social, emotional needs, kids who have suffered trauma, not being in schools uh, of late. And so I think we need to get folks, educators trained, teachers, support staff, principals, superintendents, everybody's got to get some uh, some high quality training. We're working with um, NFI to do some of that in May to get some webinars going for educators. Um, and so we're trying to do that training. That, but that would be related to the Kona return. And then backwards on or following that, then I think you'd have to do the 173 um, training thereafter. But I think the priority, frankly, ought to be getting everybody ready to welcome kids back into school whenever we can do that and safely and, and to meet their needs of which there will be a plenty. Yeah, it may, be that I'm, it may be that I'm trying to draw a comparison that really isn't apt, but um, I'm, I was thinking about a lot of the testimony we heard this year, um, or I guess maybe just some of the anecdotal stories we've heard about proficiency-based learning and how it's been such a great success in the districts where um, the educators had a lot of professional development and training around it and how it's backfired and been um, really poorly received in um, schools where that was not the case. And so I'm just wondering if this applies at all or whether um, when it comes to Act 173, the funding switch just needs to happen and then the practice will follow or whether we should be trying to learn the same lesson here, or maybe it's just not relevant. I don't know. I think it's perhaps relevant and, and uh, you dragged me into the PBGR conversation, but I do think that, that there's wisdom. To sorry. Gain. No, no, that's fine. It, I think there is. I also, I also want to make sure that we're not using our time to move off into a, you know, a, a totally um, different area. So Kathleen, I think we're going to like to hold on that question because it's, it's okay, rather Okay, because I wanted to talk doesn't... next about the reading wars. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, that was a joke. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, I, I I, so I do think there's some, some wisdom to training and, and uh, the difference here with 173, and I'll go back to that, Madam Chair, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, is that uh, I think unlike in many other instances, I'll say it that way, where a lot of, time, a lot of times we use money to change behavior. In this case, what we're trying to do is change educators' behavior and, and how they deliver services to kids. If we don't get this right, those who will suffer truly will be the kids and the highest need kids. And I think that's a, that's a, um, a, a bridge too far. We need to make sure that we train educators. And that was, the, in fact, that was the, the foundation, again, of the DMG report upon which 173 was built. It was changing the behavior first and then getting to the finances. And I think that because we all understood in 018, 2018 that um, that was necessary. That was critical to the success of kids. You only get to be a third grader once. And we needed to make sure that we got you the services you needed as a third grader uh, and not just change the funding behind it. 
Okay, thanks. Sarita, mm -hmm. and then Peter. And then what I'd like to do is have an opportunity for us to, to talk about some of the potential changes. So Sarita and then Peter. Hi. Um, so when I read the DMG report, I don't know if it was two years ago, I was really hopeful, you know, about um, addressing some inequities uh, with children. And, you know, at, and then the waiting study came out, you know, that where those inequities hadn't been addressed or looked at for 20 years, I'm really concerned. I understand everybody is doing the best they can I understand we're in an unprecedented time, but I am really concerned about delaying, um, you know, the implementation, especially with the practices. I don't know what would need to happen, but beginning to delay, you know, when uh, to implement those practices uh, as soon as possible. Because I mean, you're talking about a kid in kindergarten, by the time they're in sixth grade would be when we're beginning possibly to implement, you know, the, the best practices in the DMG report. So that's really concerning to me. And I know the committee is really quite tired of me talking about data, but I feel like we're also having this conversation without having any, I don't have any understanding as to where Vermont children are at in their grades and proficiency. And, you know, it'd be really helpful for me to get like a baseline um, I think we have the data. I'm not asking, you know, to create it. I think we have it, but just have an understanding of where, what the baseline is in terms of proficiency of Vermont kids, you know, and what that probably will look like delaying a year. And then, you know, then again, extending um, the implementation of 173 another year. I mean, I just feel like we just can't have those kids just wait, you know, to get their needs or, their education addressed. And I don't know what the answer is, but waiting indefinitely is very, very worrisome to me. This is just waiting. This is just delaying the funding formula. I thought it was the practices because of the professional development. Well, I, I, th I think you're both right in a way. Uh, we're, we're trying to change the practice. That should go on. And so the delay is in the funding, but we're not hopefully not uh, delaying the professional development. And I will say that, you know, what I'm hearing from the field is that they, they haven't had much, if any, PD when it comes to Act 173, to be very blunt. Uh, okay. I, 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 when I met with uh, a group of teachers just prior to this whole, you know, pandemic, this health crisis, uh, I asked anybody to, to raise their hand if they understood the numbers 173 in that order. Um, and I got like one or two people to put their hand up. And when I said Act 173, like one other person put their hand up out of a group of probably 40 or so people, teachers. And so the vast majority of teachers don't even understand what Act 173 is in, in most schools. And, and that's worrisome to me. It's worrisome that we're going to change how we fund something that most people don't even know what it is yet. And so that's that's why we're concerned and why we think a delay is, is all the so important. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't keep or try to train people. It's just delaying how we fund it. We want to, we, want to, we, we you know, Representative Austin, I agree with you. We believed in the goals of 173. We did, it just required some training. We want that to go on. Mm -hmm. I know it's, it's concerning to me, you know, for the children, you know, for the kids that I may not be getting the skills and instruction that will help them advance. It's a little hard to lose our literacy bill. Yeah, um, I know. Peter Conlon. Uh, so I just say that, um, you know, I'm very sympathetic to what Jeff is saying. We have obviously heard plenty about the lack of um, sort of state implemented professional development. There's a lot going on in the districts that are thinking about this and can frankly afford the professional development. So it, it is going on. I think if you were to ask that same group of teachers that Jeff was talking about, if they knew about MTSS and some of the other facets that Act 173 is supposed to be built upon, they, they would actually know what we're talking about. Uh, we're taking our, gas, our feet off the gas right now a little bit because of this delay. Um, 
I'd hate to take it off indefinitely, especially with the rulemaking and um, a lot of this sort of administrative stuff that has to go into this. Uh, I think I'd like to see that, you know, on the delay that we're talking about. Um, but if the field is not ready, uh, you know, when we feel it, it could be or should be, I think we should address that at the time. But I'd hate to have us take our foot off the gas too much just in terms of getting rules done, um, the work of the, um, uh, of the advisory board uh, and, and all that. And I'm, and I'm in complete agreement that if you say indefinite delay, boy, does that really take the pressure off and you know, people can just simply stop worrying about it. So I, what I'd like to do is just take a minute and look at some of the recommendations we have to the current draft. And I have to say, um, Jim, I'm not sure if we should just be listing these as things that we want, we'd like the Senate to consider as well, or whether we should draft language. I'm, I'm just not sure. I, I, I don't want to get ahead of them in this, but I would, I would like, the, I'd like these issues um, on the table um, with them. So I guess- I we've been just drafting language pretty efficient because they'll see what you want that way right yeah they can always reverse out of it and give yeah. you something else. so i guess i would suggest um keeping going with that approach for the state okay that sounds good so we have a couple of things on the table one has to do with the changes in rulemaking recommended by the state board of ed um, and I, ch Emily, I checked with you, the agency's okay with that, right? Can't remember. Yes, that's the extension of time for rulemaking on the current rules that are open now. We're in agreement with that. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe Jim, you've probably been taking better notes than I have. So the current, the language that the state board is talking about is, is a little bit different. Um, um, well, so extending those rules, uh, John mentioned through the SA, uh, section 843C, I have to look that up, but yeah, we can easily extend those, those rule, that rule period out eight months or out to December 31st of this year. Um, and then secondly, I think he wanted to delay the rulemaking for independent schools to March 1, 2021. So, um, and I'm hearing from, I'm hearing John, John would like to keep it as um, the, all at the same time. I'm hearing some others that would, that would not committee. So I, I, I'm gonna propose then that we um, right. stick with the, stick with, let me put this out. We're gonna stick with the plan that they're, they're happening a, a year later as, as is currently addressed. John, did you wanna say something? I'm, I, I understand the committee's wish to do that. That's fine. The, the, that leaves nonetheless the need to delay um, initiating rulemaking from uh, right. date of 1 November to 1 March. And since we didn't actually hit that part of the bill, Emily? Yeah. You're muted, Emily. Sorry. You could alternatively change the year on that November 1 date to 2022, which would be even more time than the board is asking for, or sorry, it would be 2021, November 1, 2021. So committee, do we want them to sort this out? <laughs> you guys go back in the back room and sort of get come up with the language. Is that okay, Jim? Is that okay with the committee? I can, I can put the language with what I have now. I just have to know whether the, the date we're moving to is November 1, 2021, or March 1, 2021. That's all, that's all I need. Say that again. All I, need to, all I need to know to draft this is whether you want to push up the independent school making rule to March 1, 2021, or to November 1, 2021. About July. So. How many would like to just keep it as it is, as is, as recommended by a bunch of folks? 
uh, are we talking about two different things here? One being deadline for rulemaking and the other being the actual implementation? I, th I think that what Jim was talking about is where, what do we want to do with the independent schools, correct? For, for rulemaking. For rulemaking. Yeah. So I think you decide to, to keep the date pushed out by a year, to set that aside. Now for rulemaking, uh, we have a proposal from John Carroll, uh, Chair Carroll, to move it to March 1, 2021, and from um, Emily to move it to November 1, uh, 2021. So if I get a date, I can draft either way. <laughs> Would you concur with July 2021 and and just get on with it? Th that is for the beginning of rulemaking. It's nothing to do with the implementation. I, th I think our committee is, is, as I look around, I think we're looking for the people that are really um, on the ground with this to come up with what's best there. Um, Tracy, did you have a comment? Sorry, let me unmute. Yeah, I would agree with Chair Carroll's recommendation, even or even July, but I think having some more time, the rules are taking a lot of time and they have to be right. So, I think we very would quickly. Her. Okay, bye. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Jim, what does that do to that wonderful calendar that you've made in terms of these delays, these additional delays? Well, the additional delay is already reflected in the calendar for uh, when uh, the grant funding starts and for, for when the rules apply to independent schools. It's already there. We're talking about, um, uh, we're talking about a topic here that's not in the chart because it's quite, quite um, narrow actually. Um, so it wouldn't affect this chart further. Peter? Okay, I, I, would, I would just say I'd support those folks sorting out this state, I don't think it has much impact on what we're talking about. Yeah. These are some details that um, I'd, I'd like the people that really know the differences to sort that out. Okay. Okay. Um, Kathleen, are you? Uh, Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's fine. I, I just wanted to make sure that nothing important was changing on the fly. So if, if, if all the important deadlines are just moving in lockstep or staying as they were in lockstep, that's great. If what we're talking about is, is minor and it's not gonna have a big impact on anybody and all the important people are working it out, that's fine. Okay, so you'll you'll work that out and talk to Jim, um, John, and Emily, and and that'd be great. Um, is there anything else that I've forgotten? I have notes scratched here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I, ha I haven't given this new draft to um, Megan Roy yet. So we'll just, just do that. Um, and at the same time, we might just, just wait a minute and see what the Senate's gonna do. Are they taking it up this week or not? Jim, do you remember? Uh, it's not on the calendar, no. It's not on the calendar, okay. Well, I don't think that the, uh, the calendar for, for today, no. The calendar for there in this week is, is still being developed. Okay. All right, so we'll we'll keep working on this. And this is not an April. This is a May. <laughs> this is a, a, a calendar year May. That is, um, okay. Bill. Okay, so are we done with this topic, Emily? I have, if so, I have a, a question for you. Um, what, as you you might have noticed, there's a little uh, dust up happening with Vermont State Colleges. A couple of challenges over there, and do you have? I, I was looking at the I was looking at the, the personnel chart that we got in January. Is there anybody that it is identified there that actually works on issues related to post secondary institutions? The person who had been doing that work also had an, a part of their FTE doing school construction, so two things that for us did not come up as frequently as other issues. Yeah. And that person left the agency in the 
fall and the position has not been filled yet. So capacity at the agency on that right now is probably don't go knocking on your door for too much. <laughs> well, lucky me, the secretary has designated me as the point person on post-secondary issues until we hire that position. Okay, excellent. Good to know. Um, we're, we're standing by watching and I assuming that, that uh, at some point there may be something before our committee. Um, so anything else? Okay, we can stop that topic. I just wanted to do a little bit of committee discussion um, related to um, budget delays and just give you an update on where we are with that. Um, we have we have some superintendents and school board. No, I think we've got one superintendent and some school board members coming in. On oh, we've got superintendent Sam and. Uh, but we have both coming in to talk to us. Uh, these are our members of the 19 districts that uh, do not have a budget. Um, my conversation with the Senate uh, last week is that they're pretty well down the road on a bill that would just offer a delay um, with the ability to, to use your uh, 2020 uh, budget that that's an option that, that they're pretty far down the road with. I'm working on trying to get some flexibility to consider something more along the line of what we were discussing in um, Ways and Means. So to that effect, um, Larry and Peter and I have worked a little bit uh, on looking at perhaps something that would incorporate um, the Senate option as one way of going or another one that uh, might involve um, uh, authorizing school boards to, uh, to develop a, their own budget. And, and they're a little bit different lines, whether it was a defeated budget or, a, um, or one that just hadn't been presented to voters yet. So we're working on that language. Is that something, does that sound uh, okay at this point? I was, was gonna bring this forward on, on Friday once we get this um, developed. Is that, does that sound like it's uh, in concert with you folks that that's a direction you, you're interested in considering? That's okay. Um, I ended up uh, taking a, a better look at, at this and this thing that we got from, um, from Chloe. And not everybody is, you know, as much of a geek on the detail as I am, but I finally got a better feel for what the major differences are in these districts. And I'm hoping that by Friday we'll be able to get a, an idea about what some of the impacts would be um, in uh, offering some of these options to school districts. So I'm, I'm trying to look at it not as an either or, the Senate possibility in ours, um, at, at, uh, but perhaps two different options that, that, uh, that we could pursue. So that's where we are at this point. And so we'll be, we'll be bringing that forward on, on Friday. So with that, um, I'm wondering if maybe Dylan, would you be up for just giving us a little update on what you've been doing <laughs> of late as a trustee? Yeah, uh, I don't know if that's something that, that we can discuss now. Um, can people um, hear me? Yes. You gotcha. Oh, good. I'm, I'm doing an experiment today using my phone to call in because oh. I have bad bandwidth here, even in the suburbs of Burlington. So what can we do? <laughs> Um, so yeah, just a quick update. Uh, I know I think most of the committee was on the call Friday when we just talked about uh, the chancellor's proposal which, for the state colleges, which he put out uh, shortly before our hearing. I think it was. Oh, no, no. It might have been right around the time of our hearing. At any rate, I just mentioned in passing that something was coming out. Um, of course, that, that proposal went forward. And uh, People have had some time to respond to it, react to it, including the governor and legislative leaders uh, who have expressed some concerns about the immediacy of it. 
um, and have uh, suggested there may be some way to provide some financial support so the state colleges system could find a way forward and then there could be more discussion about how best to proceed with public higher education in the state going forward. Um, those conversations are ongoing. I want you to know, I want you to know that uh, the state colleges system board met yesterday. We had a very long session starting at one o'clock um, that had a very uh, concentrated public comment period that ran for several hours or so. Um, and we met late into the evening, close to 10 o'clock, um, and had a lot of discussions. No decisions have been made yet. The way the governance structure works, the chancellor has the ability to propose, kind of like an executive with the legislature, and then the board has the ability to decide and to propose counter proposals if it wishes to, uh, using the administration and others to develop that and research it and so forth. So this is an ongoing discussion. Uh, clearly, if your inbox is anything like mine, you've heard a lot of feedback. And I, I just think as a personal advocate, not as a board member speaking, but as a legislator who cares about public higher education, I think the advocacy and interest is fantastic. I've never seen anything like it, even on staff when I was working in the speaker's office. So seeing it galvanized is really important. And the student voice and community voice, faculty voice, um, and folks from all walks of life who have come forward to weigh in on this, it's really been powerful and moving. So as a legislator watching this and as a member of the board, um, I just want you to know that it, it certainly feels to me like we have um, decisions coming and that some of those decisions may uh, become legislative decisions. So certainly as the education committee, I want you to all be aware of that. And if you have any questions individually or with groups of people, constituents, send them my way. I've had a great time talking to people. I, I hate to talk to people in a crisis, but I love to talk to people uh, when something is of great importance. And it really, it's been an honor as an alum of CCD and Johnson, I've really enjoyed it. So. We'll work through this, um, but mostly I want you to know that I'm here as a resource if you have questions or comments. Thank you, Dylan. Um, in the uh, the statement from the pro tem and from uh, the speaker um, in this, what they're recommending is an economic analysis of the impact of the closures on the three host communities as well as the development of a one-year bridge to keep the camp campuses operating while they're thinking about the future of the campuses that they're more, more thoughtfully considered um, and the establishment of a multi-institution work group. So th this, there are some things that may be coming forward. I've meanwhile been um, looking at some of the national trends in relation to um, low birth weights uh, student, you know, the, the, the demographics and those challenges as well, um, along with what we know would be a pretty significant economic impact for those communities hit by this. So um, we'll just be standing by and, and um, Dylan, thank you so much. We're lucky to have you on as a trustee to keep us informed on, on the thinking there. This is not a new one. Uh, this is not a new problem. Peter Conlon. Uh, hey, Dylan, um, I'm just curious about timeline. Uh, you guys have scheduled your, your next meeting for Monday, I think. Is that right? And, and if so, so... we're actually, yeah, we're calling a meeting as well this evening to have some board deliberation. Um, yeah, I, I do, you know, I don't want to predict the future. I'm just one board member. But given the significant interest from the legislature and governor, um, while we are in a position where we need to make uh, decisions in an expeditious fashion, I don't think there's a set timeline at this point because we now have multiple actors involved. And frankly, I think as a legislator speaking here, it's really prudent and wise at this point to slow it down a little bit and see what we can develop. Because when you get the congressional delegations involved and you start talking about federal money, state money, the governor, it's a much broader conversation. So we're going to continue to work and put a lot of time into it. And I actually think I look a little tired today because I was answering you emails from tired. midnight last night. Uh, but you know what? It, it, it really, again, this is one where we all have to step up. It's so important. It's the statewide. I'm looking around at the pains here. Everyone has some, some CCV or some VSC in their backyard. 
So I'm not sure if we will have a decision next Monday. I know there was a lot of publicity on that. Um, it is a fluid situation. Thank you very much, Dylan. So we met, I met with the, um, the chancellor, uh, the chair of the, of the, the, the board and on, um, the other day, a bunch of us met uh, with them. They presented their their PowerPoint and indicated that it was between uh, Representative Cooper and I did. Um, indicated that the bridge would be about twenty to twenty five million, um, and we are hoping that maybe our federal delegation will be able to help with that. That's one of the avenues that they're looking at for that. So think, while uh, we figure out what to do, yeah, Larry. Yeah, Dylan, um, you know, one of the issues that comes up is going into the reserve, which is not that much money. I think you have 8.7 million. Um, and, and the issue came up, the, some of the colleges that have closed did exactly that. I mean, they, they burned through their reserves pretty quickly, which I think is evidence as we see it, that means closure. Um, the other thing that was brought up um, is accreditation, uh, which is another serious issue, as you know. Um, I, I'm sure that you're discussing these in your in your meetings. I, I hope you are. But you know, twelve million dollars a month to run this system is a lot of money. I'm not. I, I have reservation uh, reservations about sustainability. Um, and the last thing we want to do is put the whole system in insolvency. Um, so I'm just bringing that out. It, it's for your your discussion, if you can, or I'm sure you are, with your trustees. Um, I'm sure it's on the table. Um, and the other yeah. issue, of course, Jeb had mentioned he had talked with UVM. Um, whether or not I, I brought this up about 10 or 11 years ago to people around here um, in terms of having a uh, University of Vermont at Castleton, the University of Vermont at Johnson. Um, I, I'm sure those discussions were brought out as well, but I'm just saying again that, you know, there are ways to move forward, I guess. Lynn Bachelor. Yeah. Hi there. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Dylan. Did you want to respond? Let, let's just go to, to Lynn and then respond to it all. <laughs> I just got an an email from Kendall Smith, and uh, this is regarding, and it was to address to the Northeast Kingdom legislators, hoping hoping that the uh, governor, and he's saying that the legislature will have to be a partner in the funding conversation and the governor can propose to move money around, but it ultimately will be for the legislature to incorporate into one of the various money bills. But it says that he does not, he's very strongly um, for keeping the college system open if at all possible. So it says some, but doesn't say much. How's that? <laughs> It's, it's just something I think to make us feel better up here because somehow the Northeast Kingdom always seems to get the short end of the stick. So I will behave and sign off. Thank you. <laughs> well, and we do know that I think the proposal he's considering cradle, cradle to career. So um, keep in mind where he may be looking. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Sarita? Um, and I, you know what, we, we, we're really just about essentially done, so we can go off pretty soon, but please go ahead, Sarita. Yeah, just one question and um, about the boards are, that have not, the districts that haven't passed a budget. I'm just wondering, are the boards in the process of developing a, a proposed budget or are they, I'm just not sure we are, where we are in that process. And um, just one more question about, I think what came out of COVID-19 for me that was glaring in terms of the rural communities was equity and access to broadband. 
Um, and I'm just, I, I, we don't need to have a discussion now, but that is, it, that is glaring to me. And it's not just for COVID-19, it's in terms of access to educational opportunities. So I just wonder at some point, it, will we have a conversation about that or is this the committee that would have that conversation? That's it. Um, Peter Kahn. And then why don't you, can you just wrap up and then we're gonna close. <laughs> Anything. Sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. I'm all undone. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Emily, thank you so much for joining us and, and sticking with it with us. Um, Jay and Jeff and Tracy as well. Have I missed anybody? I don't think so. Um, as we, yeah, Jay, there you are. <laughs> as we um, move forward uh, with the two bills that are before us, we will be keeping in mind the, the status of the Vermont State Colleges and see where it is that we may end up weighing in. Thank you, everybody. I will see you Friday.